Babies may be diagnosed with hydrocephalus while they're still in the womb, so during the antenatal scan. And if that's the case, then the delivery is preempted and we will deal with that child soon after it's born. For the other causes, such as infection or bleeding or a tumour, for small babies, the head tends to expand and grows off the normal growth chart. Everyone in the UK gets given a red book, so the child's head is measured. And if we see that the head is getting bigger than it should be, for that child, again, we worry about hydrocephalus. Other symptoms in a baby are the head veins start to pop out, the child's eyes may deviate downwards, they may feel really quite sick. And for the older children, once the bones have closed, is often headache when they can articulate that, nausea, vomiting, and sometimes sleepiness or drowsiness. So uh, hydrocephalus has many causes and often the treatment is to deal with the cause. For example, if someone has a big brain tumour that's pushing the normal fluid chambers of the brain and blocking them, removing that tumour may be the treatment. If we get away from those ones where the cause is dealt with, then generalised hydrocephalus in a, in a baby or an adult, we'd either look at diverting the fluid within the brain, something called an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is keyhole surgery, we make a new hole at the bottom of the brain to let the fluid out. The other option is to put in something called a shunt, which is where a small tube goes into the brain and is attached to a small valve, which then runs down into the tummy. And that fluid, it's like an overflow pipe, that fluid drains internally into the abdomen and gets reabsorbed back into the blood. So those are the main two ways we deal with the hydrocephalus. So uh, for a child or an adult who needs treatment of hydrocephalus, if you don't treat them, they will die. It's as simple as that. So treatment isn't an option. This is a life-saving operation. The risks of the actual operation are quite small. With any surgery, there's a risk of bleeding, there's a risk of infection, there's a risk of damaging the brain, a risk of stroke, a risk that what you put in the tube is in the wrong place or it can break or malfunction. The overall risk during surgery runs probably under 1%. In the long term, however, shunts tend to block off <clears throat> and about 80% of shunts will stop working in 20 years. And what I explain to my patients, having a shunt is probably a bit like having a car or a washing machine. It may work forever. It may break down tomorrow. You just don't know. So we warn the patients things to look out for. If their child suddenly gets headaches, nausea, vomiting, having been well, we would rescan. The shunt's blocked, we replace it. So the most important part of managing hydrocephalus is education for the patient and for the obviously the children, for the family. So they need to know, as I've explained, that if the shunt isn't working, which it can block at any time, the child or the adult may get headaches, nausea, vomiting, and if there's any uncertainty, they need to be seen as an emergency. We'd often say A&E. In the private sector, if it's daytime hours, they can ring one of our secretaries and we will see them and scan them. Um, so again, just having, just being wary of what the potential symptoms may be if the shunt stops working. And if it does stop working, it needs to be replaced, which is quite straightforward to do. So when there's an antenatal or a, a early diagnosis in childhood, there's a very good setup actually within the hospitals. There's a um, usually a paediatric CNS, so one of the a clinical nurse specialists who has an interest in hydrocephalus and they can put the parents in touch with other parents who have children with hydrocephalus which is always helpful just that familiarity and discussion there's various resources they have there's various charities um there's hydrocephalus association or asba again who are very helpful with many resources there's leaflets and there's books um so that's helpful certainly initially but then Having the specialist liaison nurse uh, or a nurse specialist as a point of contact for that family for good is also very helpful because questions are going to arise later on in life and there are going to be issues, you know, can my child play rugby? Can they play netball? That sort of thing. So there's an ongoing relationship with the, with the staff is paramount. But yes, there's lots of information that we provide to all our parents once the child is diagnosed. <laughs> 